morning. Um, I had a panic this morning. I thought I was going to be the only female speaking, but I'm glad to know there's two more panicked and thought I was going to have to totally change my presentation to speak about feminism rather than health. But anyway, um, there's two more later in the afternoon. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to ask you all to think about a few questions. I want you all to think in your mind about what you're good at, about what you like to do, about what skills you have, and what you're passionate about. And now think, do you think that the skills that you have, and do you think that what you're good at, do you think that that could affect the health of thousands of people living around the world? Do you think that your skills could stop the spread of TB? Do you think that they could provide emotional and medical support to shut-ins living in urban areas? Um, do you think that they could help get life-saving medications into the hands of people that need them? So think about that. So this is Jeffrey Miso Mali on the left. He is from Blantyre, Malawi. And this is Emily Bierce on the right, and she is from Hudson, Ohio. And Jeffrey and Emily work together, and more often at work, they are better known as Gemily. <laughs> so Jeffrey in this picture is 27, and Emily is 24, making Gemily 51 years old. Basically, Gemily is a young baby boomer. And Jeffrey and Emily represent a powerful notion that motivated young people can make an impact in the field of global health. And while doing that, they can also build skills to become the next generation of leaders in global health. Jeffrey and Emily are two of the most impressive people that I know. And they're not just impressive because they're dedicated and they're committed and they're smart and hardworking and also very good looking. They are impressive because of what they were able to accomplish together last year. For the past two years, for the past year, excuse me, Jeffrey and Emily have been working together as two Global Health Corps fellows with the Clinton Foundation in Malawi. They are working in a district called Machinga. Machinga is a very rural district. It's the type of place that Jeffrey describes somewhere no one ever stops. Someone would just keep driving through because there's no reason to stop there unless you really want to buy fish at some fish market. Um, Jeffrey and Emily spent their time in this very rural district um, driving off of all the tarmac roads into uh, down sandy roads past miles and miles and miles of mango trees to visit clinics that were bustling, that were full of women with babies strapped on their back. And this type of district, Machinga, it also has a 25% HIV AIDS rate, which means that a quarter of the people living in this entire district have HIV. So Jeffrey and Emily started their work there in order to pilot and implement a maternal and child health program. This program provided emotional support for HIV positive mothers that were pregnant, while also ensuring that they had access to medication so that they would have HIV negative babies. Throughout this year, Jeffrey and Emily enrolled 4,000 pregnant mothers in their program. So this is 4,000 pregnant women that are receiving emotional support, but this is also 4,000 pregnant women that are having HIV-negative babies. Jeffrey and Emily, in one year, were able to work with partners and to truly affect 4,000 women that were HIV-positive, allow them to bring home 4,000 HIV-negative babies. It's 4,000 families. It's a whole community. So they're impressive because of what they were able to do. They're their motivations for doing this were different. Jeffrey's motivations for doing this type of work was very personal. He had grown up in Malawi. His father had passed away when he was 12 because of HIV, and he knew that the second that he had a degree, the second that he had skills that he could offer, he was going to devote them to making sure that no one else had this experience. And Emily, on the other hand, was sort of a health nut. She was one of those people that always took biology, majored in biology, got her master's in public health. So she was super psyched to be able to get into the field and use everything that she had learned to make this type of change. Jeffrey and Emily are impressive because they represent a whole mass of other young people. They're not only impressive because of what they've done, but they're impressive because they represent the first 60 Global Health Corps fellows that we've had from 10 countries over the past year and a half that have been working in East Africa and the United States, and they represent our vision for future change makers in global health. So you might wonder, how Jeffrey and Emily ended up here. Well, the idea for Global Health Corps was conceived at a conference, not that different than this. Um, it was a conference hosted by UNAIDS and Google, and a challenge was presented. How can we engage more recent college graduates and young professionals to truly try to make a change in health equity? This challenge was said. Uh, my sister and two of our other co-founders were sitting in a small group at that conference, and for three hours, they brainstormed about this. How could they try to engage more young people, get them excited about making a change in health? 
And after their three-hour brainstorming session was finished, so there's the challenge, engage more young people in health. After their session was finished, they presented their ideas to a bunch of nodding heads. And my sister and these two left this conference, and they continued to keep wrestling with this challenge. And I quickly became involved, and I didn't become involved because I'm a do-gooding tree hugger as someone that may or may not have started TED called me this morning. Um, I got involved because of my previous experience working in health at a children's hospital in South Africa, followed by working for UNICEF in Botswana. And in, imprinted in my mind are memories and are memories and images of basically holding and playing and taking care of tiny children that I, I had thought were two at the time and later found out were seven because they had lacked access to health care. And you know, being 23, this was something that was so difficult for me to wrap my mind around. But those images are also paired with really inspiring images that I have imprinted in my mind about dedicated, committed people that have devoted their time and the skills that they had to make sure that this didn't happen to others. So I quickly jumped on board, and as anyone that's curious and thinking about starting something new, we got to work, we started researching like crazy, we spoke with anyone that would talk to us, any, uh, anyone involved in the health field, anyone more experienced with, than us in the development field, really anyone. And after a few months, our team had grown to six, we had a business plan, we pitched it to google.org, and we got our first grant. Teach for America had been our muse. We were all recent college graduates. We had seen how Teach for America had effectively shown that no matter what your skill set, you could make an impact in a field that desperately needed it. But could we do the same for health? Could we show people that whatever your skills are, you can make a difference with them? And every meeting that we walked into with every executive, every student, every global health leader, every business person, every single person validated the dire and urgent need to invest in the next generation of global health leaders, because who else is going to work on these challenges? We walked into all of these meetings basically expecting to hear a bunch of no's, and instead we walked out with $250,000. So why our generation and why global health? Well, through our research, we knew that Jeffrey and Emily were just two of hundreds of thousands of young people that wanted to serve in this field. Um, we're sort of the first generation that has grown up completely connected. You could live in Chicago and know exactly about health disparity in Burundi, health disparity in Burundi from watching it on YouTube. So there's already, we're sort of already easy to access knowledge about this. Um, and over the past three years, it was proven that there's a ton of interest of young people to work in the global health space. The number of students enrolled in global health programs in the United States and Canada has tripled in the past two, has doubled in the past three years. Um, and 55 universities have created brand new global health programs to meet this need. Organizations like the One Campaign and Face Aids have piqued the interest of hundreds of thousands of young people around the world to advocate on behalf of global health. But all these people also want to know how can they take action? What can they do? Um, and it's no surprise that our generation has been intrigued by this. We've grown up reading really overwhelming headlines like this, citing a failing war on AIDS, citing millions of deaths from malaria. And these, to me, these headlines are extremely overwhelming. They're almost paralyzing and they're enraging to me because these are preventable and treatable illnesses. So we've seen all of these, but we've also seen headlines like these showing that positive change can happen, that there is ways to move forward in this space, that people can make an impact on the lives of others because these illnesses are preventable and treatable. We've seen tons of you know, overwhelming statistics like this. And I feel like these, you know, they can definitely paralyze people, but the second that you start to see the positive change happens, I, I truly believe that most people, and I think most people in our generation do believe that there's hope and that you can make a difference if you can figure out how to fit yourself into the equation. So we started Global Health Corps to harness all the passion and the skills and the energy of young people in our generation to confront these huge, massive challenges. Um, these challenges are so complex that they require skill sets far beyond medicine. They require people with business skills. They require people with engineering, engineering skills. Um, they require people with supply chain management skills, education skills. To truly see innovative solutions in this space, we need, uh, we need to basically engage an entire generation. We need public mobilization to make changes and to get to creative solutions. The health field typically isn't thought of as a space for a lot of creativity. Doctors treat people. So let's bring more creativity to it. So the Global Health Corps model is based on partnership. We partner with existing organizations. 
right now organizations that are working in the United States and East Africa. We find out their needs, and then we recruit recent college graduates and young professionals with specific skills to fill those needs. It's, as I said, a partnership model, so everywhere we work, there's one fellow from that country partnered with an international fellow. Right now, our fellows have been from 10 countries, which makes this group of young people truly global. Um, we're interested in the impact that our fellows can have within the year that they're working for this organization, but we're really even more interested in what they're gonna do with the rest of their lives. And so throughout the year, we supplement it with training, professional development, mentorship, community building, because we know that, that they can work as a community stronger than they can as an individual. Um, we launched our first class of 22 very adorable fellows last August. Um, we received about 1,200 applications for these 22 positions, which showed that there was an interest in doing this work. These 22 all completed their fellowship this past August, and all 22 are continuing to work in the global health field. We added 38 more this past August, and we intend to double for the next few years. So what do these people look like? What does our future change maker in global health look like? Well, they look like this sort of blurry man, Amit Salvi. Um, <laughs> Amit Savi is a 27-year-old from Illinois who graduated with an engineering degree from UC Berkeley. After graduation, he went to work for Restoration Hardware, followed by The Gap, working specifically doing supply chain management. And after three years in retail, he started looking around for other things that he could do and places that he could use his skills. He applied to be a Global Health Corps fellow, was accepted, quit his job at The Gap, and about a month later, was working in Tanzania. He was specifically actually working on Zanzibar, which is an island of one million people. And he was specifically working to support the supply chain of drugs for all one million people. So basically, Amit is doing the same thing that he was doing at The Gap, but instead of focusing on getting jeans from warehouses into Gap stores, he's now focused on getting drugs from warehouses into clinics and into the hands of the patients that need them most. Um, Amit speaks about what an honor it is to be able to use his skills in a new field. And though probably a year and a half ago, he never would have expected that this would be his career, it's clearly a first step in social justice. He completed his fellowship this past August and is now working in Kenya at a, a very interesting organization called the One Acre Fund. Um, global health leaders also look like this. This is Brandon on the right and this is Commode. Brandon and Commode are architects. Um, and they're also Global Health Corps fellows. Commode is a karate, karate master. He speaks Chinese and he's from Rwandan. And Brandon is a recent master's in architecture graduate from Cornell. Brandon and Commode are working together with a design firm called Mass in, in Rwanda and they're contracted to work with Partners in Health and the Minister of, of Health in Rwanda. And they are basically designing and building a brand new hospital in the Barrera District, which is a district of 400,000 people and it's never, ever had a hospital. Um, and what's very cool is Brandon and Commode can use their design minds to build a very smart, efficient hospital. They're creating changes like changes in airflow so that TB and other airborne diseases don't affect the other patients or anyone that walks into the hospital. So they're still architects, but this time their, their clients are the patients that attend the hospital. Um, Wanju and Godfrey are two of our fellows that are working in Boston. Uh, Godfrey is from Zimbabwe and Wanju is from New Jersey and they're amazing and I'll tell you about them afterwards if you guys wanna hear about them. Um, <laughs> running out of time. Um, this lastly is Isaac and Isaac is another one of our fellows. Isaac is from Rwanda but he, grew, he was born and raised in Uganda in a refugee camp because his family had fled the violence in Rwanda. He first entered his own country when he went to Rwanda to attend university. And after graduating with a master's degree in management sciences, he knew he desperately wanted to work to rebuild his country and to strengthen this country that he had never lived in until he was 18, basically. Um, so he applied to Global Health Corps. He was in our first class of fellows. And he quickly got to work working on procurement. He was basically procuring all of the medical equipment, medical supplies, life-saving drugs that were that were needed for this new hospital that Brandon and Commode were working on for 400,000 people. Isaac completed his fellowship this past August and now he's actually doing the same, same job, but instead of doing it for Partners in Health, he's working for the Minister of Health in Rwanda. He's working in Rwanda's government. He's working actually directly for the Deputy Minister of Health. So Isaac is a person that has gone from living as a refugee in another country to returning to Rwanda, his home country, and now he's personally shaping the health system that affects 
all of his fellow Rwandans. Um, Isaac, Amit, Brandon, Kamode, all of our 60 fellows are making an impact within the organizations where they work. And they're also making an impact on the lives that these organizations serve. No matter where they go after their fellowship year, they will be advocates for global health. These 60 fellows are just the beginning. They're just the tip of the arrow. And with each new class of fellows that we bring on, the potential for new, innovative, sustainable solutions grows exponentially, and that is what is inspiring. These are the stories of individuals that I've told you. These are the stories of single people. But this is also the story of a community. It's a community of 60 fellows working together. It's a community of our partner organizations like Partners in Health, Elizabeth Glazier, Clinton Foundations. It's the story of a community of all the people that work for them, all of our colleagues, all of our mentors, a broader community that's working towards building of movement and global health equity. So back to that challenge, how do we engage more recent college graduates and young professionals in global health? Well, when my sister and our two other co-founders were at that conference, they did more than just respond to that challenge. Those notes on that board were the beginning. They were a small piece, but they were the beginning of this broader movement in global health equity. And I'm here because of that. I'm here because that movement is growing, and I'm here because you know, it's clear that more young people are going to join us. And, and they really they did a great job with that challenge. But I want to end with a challenge for all of you. I'd like to challenge all of you to think for a few seconds about what you are good at. What skills do you have? What can you offer? What resources do you have? What headlines you know, enrage you and piss you off? What can you do to bring to bear in the global health field? So thank you very much. <laughs>